there are three clades that contain most of the multicellular organisms uh, on the Earth today. One of them we've already looked at, it's the fungi. It's within this group called the epistheconts. The second one, the one we're going to be looking at for this lecture and the next one, is in this group here. It's most closely related to the green algae and cares an, shares a number of characteristics with it. Uh, this is the group that contains the land plants. Together, the green algae and land plants make up a clade. They are all, of course, eukaryotes. Um, they rely on photosynthesis to supply themselves with energy. They're autotrophs, which means they draw on CO2 for their carbon. And they use two particular molecules to capture light energy. They're chlorophylls A and B. Uh, as I mentioned last time, or sorry, two lectures ago, there are a lot of different light gathering pigments, uh, but chlorophyll A and B are the ones that typify the plants as well as the green algae. In addition, like fungi, uh, plants have cell walls, but in this case, they're not made of chitin. They're made of a different polysaccharide called cellulose. We know cellulose as plant fiber. It's probably pretty easy for you to answer the question, why study plants? There are a tremendous number of reasons. For one thing, basically every carbon atom in your body and in the body of any other land animal was first fixed from CO2 by some kind of land plant. They're incredibly important in both energy flow and the flow of carbon and other nutrients in terrestrial ecosystems. But there are other things that plants do that are maybe even more important for us that most people don't know about. So for example, um, when you think about soil, what soil mostly is, is the decomposed remnants of plants. <clears throat> plants not only um, help to build up soil, which starts out as sort of a mineral deposit after say a glacier recedes and can only be lived in by most organisms once a lot of organic matter accumulates, they not only build up that soil, but they hold it in place. You may have heard about the great dust storms in the dust bowl, that's this area shown here, of the United States back during the 1930s. This was a direct result of the removal of plants uh, in order for industrial agriculture to take place in that area. Because farmers removed all of the plants, uh, when there was a drought, the soil was uh, able to not just dry up, but blow away in gigantic clouds, resulting in uh, the stripping of a tremendous amount of topsoil during those years that completely destroyed uh, agroecosystems in that area. So for example, here are clouds of windblown dust overtaking a car. Here they are overtaking an entire town. And here's the wasteland that resulted after uh, all of the soil had blown past. Again, this is uh, something that only happens when you strip away all of the plants from an ecosystem. So one of the ecosystem services the plants provide for us is they provide healthy soil in which we can grow crops. They also help store the water that we need. A more recent problem uh, due to land use change by human beings, specifically deforestation in parts of Central America and Africa, is that water that used to be stored in these ecosystems and released slowly uh, over the season now simply runs off the hills, causing erosion and that water very rapidly passes through um, the ecosystem and heads out to sea, making it unavailable for use by human beings. Of course, plants provide food, uh, tremendous different kinds of food. In fact, civilization itself probably depends on agriculture. Before human beings started using agriculture, there simply wasn't enough food in the environment to support a large group of human beings all living in the same area. Plants now and in ancient times provide fibers, 
that we use for things like clothes. Despite the uh, remarkable leaps forward in technology that we've made in material science, wood, which is very strong and lightweight and very inexpensive relative to other materials, remains one of our chief building materials. And um, finally, plants provide a number of different chemical compounds that we use as medication. Plants are unable to run away, and so um, they have a good deal of difficulty defending themselves against organisms like animals that try to eat them. Uh, but if they can't defend themselves physically, they can certainly defend themselves chemically. Plants have evolved a tremendous variety of chemical compounds that are bioactive. That is, they have some kind of important effect on biological organisms. Uh, often, at an appropriate dosage, this effect is very harmful or fatal, but we found that many of these compounds, if applied in smaller doses, can have very positive effects. And accordingly, a lot of the medicines that we use today are derived from plant defensive compounds. Plants have also been, or plant matter rather, has also been used as fuel for much of the history of humanity, and in fact, a lot of the fossil fuels that we use today are derived from plant matter that was laid down many millions of years ago. I'm going to present plant evolution mostly from a phylogenetic point of view. That is, I'm going to walk through the existing groups of plants today. However, as we go through these groups, I'm going to be going also through this historical story of how these plant groups arose and what evolutionary innovations they contain, because there's a clear fossil record that shows how we got from green algae to the modern plants that we have today. For the groupings that I'm presenting are, for some, to some extent, not actually good monophyletic groups. Some of the groups that I'm going to be naming are morphological groupings. They are groups of organisms that are morphologically similar, but often what they're united by, the similarities they have in their morphology, are symplesiomorphies. They are ancestral character states, which means that a number of these groups are not necessary, are not one another's closest relatives. Okay, if you build a phylogeny of the organisms that we know as land plants and their closest relatives, the green algae, the green algae here branch off at the base, suggesting that the ancestor of the land plants was something like these organisms. In other words, the traits that these organisms have among themselves are probably much like the trait that this ancestor of all of the land plants had. The green algae, um, as you should remember from when we talked about protists, um, are important participants in the symbiotic partnerships known as lichens, but they also are very important free living organisms. They're important producers in freshwater ecosystems as well as intertidal areas. They first appear in the fossil record about 725 million years ago. And um, while some of them are unicellular, some are multicellular, like this ulva, which is also called sea lettuce, and some are sort of in between. If you remember Volvox, uh, scientists have disagreements about whether that's a unicellular or multicellular organism. That's in this group, in the green algae. 